at these problems, 40 and 41, from section 5.1, do you guys understand everything from 41, or should I go through any of those? Okay, we do one of them. Which one, should I, which one would you like to see? Number A, just kind of as an example. And then if there's anything else, you guys shout it out, let me know. So A says... Yeah, that is small. Let me turn up the percentage for you guys so you can see. K equals 1 to 10 of K. And again, that, that's the Greek letter sigma. And what does it mean? It means sum. So let's write that down. The sigma, on the bottom we put K equals 1. On the top we put a 10. And it looks like that. And then in here, they just put some function, k. And what that means is wherever there's a k, you put the numbers from 1 to 10. So this means 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot, 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 plus 9 plus 10. That's what it means. I got lazy. I wrote the dot, dot, dot. But that's what it means. You guys follow? Or that was... 41A. Let me do one more. Um, they don't actually want me to compute these, do they? Oh, they want me to compute them? Do you guys know what 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 up to 10 is? 55. How'd you get it? What'd you do? Added them up? Well, I've got to pause for the story of Gauss for a minute. Anyways, I have to do one more, and then I'm, I am going to do D, I promise. Just got off a tangent. Um, but let's do E as an example, 41E, just to make sure that you guys understand what that means. When it says M equals 1 to 3 of 2M plus 2 over 3, what that means is everywhere that it used to say M, you're going to plug in numbers. Okay, so what does this equal? This equals 2 times 1 plus 2 over 3 plus 2 times 2 plus 2 over 3 plus 2 times 3 plus 2 over 3. So that's how you do E. You see that? So what's it equal? Let's see. 4 thirds plus 6 thirds plus 8 thirds. Is that what you guys got? OK. So all together, 18 thirds is 6. By the way, I should mention that this has a name, okay? Both of these have a name. These are examples of what are called arithmetic sums. It's funny, now, it's the same word as arithmetic, but you pronounce it differently. You guys have a question? I wrote six eighths, but that's surely not right. Six thirds. How'd my three get like that? Yeah, thank you. So it is 18 thirds, which is six. Okay. Anyways, these are called arithmetic. And what that means is you get from one term to the next by adding. It's called an arithmetic sum. And so what I'm saying is, do you notice what I keep adding each time to go from one term to the next? What am I adding to get, say, from 4 thirds to 6 thirds? Or, yeah, you're adding 2 thirds. When you always add the same thing to get from one to the next, that's called arithmetic. And there's another word, geometric. That's when you multiply to get to the next term. Always multiply by the same thing. 
And that'll come up more in Calc 2 than it will now. All right, I think that's enough that now we have a chance at 40, okay? So let me try 40. And you guys in particular asked about D. <coughs> Let's look at it. Uh, okay, yeah. So I guess if I'm going to do D, I mean, one of the first things I want to do is look at that and ask, well, how many terms are there? Because when you write, you know, m equals 1 to whatever, or k equals 1 to whatever, I mean, I have to pick some variable for what the index is. They, they've used k, they've used n. Um, let me go ahead and start this problem. So I guess what I'll do is I'll say, looks like they use k most often. k equals, now you could start anywhere you want. I think I'll start at 1. Okay, And if I do that, my question is, what should the top number be? And I guess I'm going to move this out of the way and have you guys talk to each other about that. Notice again in the last problem, I did m equals 1 to 3, and so there were three terms, right? You put in the 1, you put in the 2, you put in the 3. So talk to each other for a minute about what you think number 40d, what the top number should be above the sigma. You know, maybe another thing to say, when you write the formula next to the sum, the only thing that's going to have k involved are things that are changing. If you look at the last problem I did, where the m was, that was the only thing that changed. You see how everything else stayed the same. So I guess, looking back at number 40, what is it that always is going to stay the same? The 1 on top, right? So we know we're going to have 1 over stuff, right? And so I guess what I decided was, as I'm looking at this, it seems like it's always a product down here of two numbers. And so if I'm starting at 1, I can call this first one k. And what would the other one be? It's always 1 more than k, so k plus 1. You guys with me? And so now we just have to figure out where do we go from. k equals 1, 2. Well, the last term is 49 times 50, so I think this should be a 49. Does, does that make sense? And this is one possible answer. There are other answers. Can I show you another one? How about this one? So, or, what if you started at 0 and went up to 48 and did 1 over k plus 1 times k plus 2? That would work also. Plug in 0, and you'll still get 1 over 1 times 2 for the first term. There's actually infinitely many answers. I mean, some people may have simplified. k equals 1 to 49, 1 over k squared plus k. All right? So these are series. When you, when you add things over and over again, this is sigma notation, it's called. And it, it's something that we're using a little bit now. We're going to use a lot in Calc 2. So I just want to introduce, introduce it to you. OK? Any other questions from homework? Yeah, Stephanie. 43, they want the left sum, the right sum, and the midpoint. That's right. So you know, my formula is how we put it in our calculator. Right, because it says, it says Riemann sums, and it says a little t here. They want you to use a calculator. Oh, I don't know. Do you? Do you guys have the right sum in your calculator from last time? Okay, let me get my calculator out. I have... Let me get it back. Here. When I press program, I have right sum in my calculator. I don't even have left sum. Do any of you guys have left sum? You know, I, I handed that out. And does anybody have midpoint in their calculator? 
So the answer is no. We don't have that. So we just have to manually figure that out? Well, okay, manually is okay. The only problem with this one, trying to do it manually, is I noticed something. I noticed they said n equals 40. And what does that mean? You need 40 little subintervals, right? Because they're trying to be real accurate. And that's why they said T, t technology. Yeah, so I don't want to do it manually, personally. And you don't either. So what the heck am I asking you to do here, right? I mean, OK, I I'll tell you my, my thought here. And I, I want to get that. Um, here, let me put this back up for you guys, because this will be helpful. Jocelyn, we're going to say something. Can I do 43? Yeah. Sure. Well, I can do part of it. I can do part of it. All right, let's do 43. Actually, this is a, a good problem to do because it really leads into today's lesson. I mean, there is a reason I assigned it. Okay, it says for the given value of n, use sigma notation to write the left, right, and midpoint Riemann sums. Then evaluate each sum using a calculator. Here we go. You ready? So, I guess my first thing to do, let me write down the function. f of x equals the square root of x on 0, 4. Okay? Matt, you have a question? Okay. So here's the, here's the function for 43. And I think I should draw a picture, I think. So let me do that. What does the square root of x look like? Well, here, I'll open this up so you can see it, and we'll close it again if we need to. So it goes through 0, 0. And why did they say to go to 4? Well, it goes through 1, 1. And it goes through 4, 2. And then it keeps going. It's, it's like the upper half of a parabola. And so the area I'm looking for is all the stuff between 0 and 4. OK. So I mentioned there was a procedure that we followed last time. And I think I want to go to the book and kind of talk you through it here. So it says, it, my definition of a Riemann sum, it says, suppose f is defined on the closed interval divided into n subintervals of equal length delta x. All right? And actually, you'll remember, on my calculator, I programmed in last time this one right sum. Let me edit it. I'm, I'm not going to change it, but I just want to kind of remind you what we did. The first thing we did is we asked, well, what are a and b? And for me, those are 4 and 0. And then what was n for us? n is 40. That's the number of little subintervals you want. And then we did b minus a over n and stored that in d. Why? What does that give you? Yeah, the delta x. It gives you the width of each of the rectangles, right? So from a picture standpoint, I'm going to, here, let me work this out. Delta x, of course, is 4 minus 0 over 40. So what is it? It's 1 tenth, right? So like the, the subintervals are going to go from 0 to 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, right? Each one is 1 tenth. And then, OK, what are we doing? We're doing right sum. If we do right sum, then the first rectangle will be above the curve, I notice, because I'm going to be taking the height. Here, look at the program one more time. I'm going to, it says for i equals 1 to 40 here, what do you do? a plus i times d. So 0 plus 1 tenth. Is that's one tenth. Put that in x, and then add on the height. So y of so f of point one. 
So the first thing that would go into the total would be the square root of 0 0.1. The next thing that would go in the total would be the square root of 0 0.2, because we're going to need the heights of all these little rectangles. And I agree, Stephanie, I don't really feel like doing that by hand. Although I could, it's not that bad. Or I could write a little program to, to calculate. Square root of 0 0.1, square root of 0 0.2, etc. right? So, anyways, what the, form, what the calculator does here is it tallies up all those y values and then it, it's multiplying always by d because that's the width, right? So it's always multiplying by 0.1. So like, just for example, the first rectangle would, be, would have a area of square root of 0 0.1 times 0 0.1. The next rectangle plus square root of 0 0.2 times 0 0.1. The next rectangle would have etc. And the last rectangle, can you tell me what the last rectangle would be? Or how about we do the second last and the last? This will tell me if you understand it. Okay, what's the width of the second last rectangle or the last rectangle? What's the width of either one of those? We said the width is the same for every rectangle here, guys. What's the width of each rectangle? One-tenth, right? So the last rectangle would be this one. And the second last rectangle would be that one. So the last rectangle has a width of 0 0.1. And the height I could see is 2, actually. But why do we get 2? Because that's the square root of 4.0. The second last rectangle would have a width of 0 0.1, and the height would be square root of what? 3.9. So if you could just add all those up, you'd have it. Sigma notation. OK, here I go. Sigma notation. K equals 1. How many of these um, rectangles are we adding together? 40, right? Because it's 4 and there's 10 in each little, because we're going by tenths. So K equals 1 to 40. What else can we fill in? Well, what stays the same? That 0 0.1 always stays the same, right? Because that's my, what is that? That's my delta x, right? What is it that changes each time? Well, the height of the rectangles. And the height of the rectangles is given by f of, the book called it x k star. Sum k equals 1 to n f of x k star delta x. In other words, what am I doing to each x k star here? I'm always taking, well, the square root of, and see how the first one was 0 0.1, the next one was 0 0.2? It seems like you're always taking the square root of, how about I say, 0 0.1 times whatever k is. I think that's the actual formula. Okay? So Stephanie says to me, well, how do you do it? One way to do this problem, okay, would be to write this formula out and compute this sum on a calculator. I can show you how to do that. Here. Second, quit. I remember that we have a command in the calculator called sum. And here's how it works. You do this. You go second, and if you can't remember where to find a, a, a function, you hit the zero, because that gold says catalog. This is every command the function does. Don't use the arrow. You'll never get there. I mean, there's a lot of functions. The reason the A is lit is so you, 
select the correct letter that it begins with. So I'm going to choose T. Oh no, I chose Z. Darn it. I'll choose T. That's the 4. Although, what's sum begin with? S. So I'll go up. But the reason I did it that way is there's a lot of S's. So I found it. There's sum. OK. And you tell it what you want to add. And what I want to add are the square roots of, well, 0 0.1 times, well, how about I say alpha k. Where the heck is k? Right here. So I'm going to add those up. And I'm going to say alpha k again because, well, what I'm doing here is having the variable k, comma, go from 1, comma, to 40. So if I remember right, that does it. Oh, man, what did I do wrong? think? No, I just remembered it wrong. Shoot, should have prepared for that question better. Have to look in the manual. No, I've got one here and I've got one there. What happened was I put the, um, I put the arguments in the wrong order. Yeah, that's this one. That's this one. Shoot. All right, I have one more try, and then I'll give up. Do you think you put the K here? I don't. I think this is right, but it's not. I'll try one more try. I'm going to insert K here. This is wrong, guys. I can't believe I'm recording this. That's awful. Uh, where's K? Help me out. That's a shoot. Alpha K. Insert a comma. I, I just the thing that's bad about these old calculators is they don't tell you the format. You know, if you have a computer error, you can look up the problem. Alright, I'll try it. No, it's wrong. Shoot. But it's something like that. It gives you the sum. Alright, well let's use our program. We've got our program, we can do it. Quit. OK. So let's do our program. We're going to hit program. Execute write sum. Here we go. What's A? What's B for us? 4. That's the other endpoint. And what's N for us? 40. And so we claim that the write sum is 26.14. It added up all that stuff. So that, that means that. If I could successfully add all this stuff up, I would get 26.14. Now, Jocelyn, you typed in the left sum one into the calculator? No. This formula? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You didn't get 26.14. Oh, I know what I did wrong. I put the wrong function in there. My goodness. Have to have the right function here. This is last last time's function. All right, let's try that again. So let's put in square root of x. Jeez, come on, Paul. And let's try it again. Program. Write sum. Run. A equals zero. B equals four. N equals forty. Boom. That's better, right? 5.42? Okay. That looks more like this area. Okay, so that area is 5.42. Is that the exact value of the area? No. Is this higher or lower than the area? Guys, is this higher or lower? Definitely higher. How do you know? You can see the rectangles are a little above the curve because I picked the right endpoint. 
Now, what would happen if I picked the left endpoint every time? Would the rectangles be above or below the curve? They'd be below. So, again, I asked, did anybody type this in, left sum? Can I see what you have when you use your calculator? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, why not? Just, uh, that's okay. Here. So, according to left sum, courtesy of Stephanie, if I type in 0, 4, and 40, and I'm assuming she has the right function in there, she got 5.22. So the area is somewhere between 5.26 and 5.22. Right? But Stephanie's question was, well, how do I do midpoint? To know how to do midpoint, you have to understand the difference between left sum and right sum. Look at the two programs. Aren't they almost identical? Where are the only differences? I claim the only difference I see is right here. You see that? So how does it work? Well, here you do A plus nothing. A plus zero is the first point. That means what's the first point? A. And if A is the first point, then on the picture, you're starting on the left. Because remember, we always say that A is X naught, less than X one, less than dot, 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 less than X minus one, less than XN. XN is B. And that's why you never get to N. You get only to N minus one when you do left sum. But when you do right sum, you go from 1 to n. You guys follow? OK. So how do you do midpoint? We would have to change the program. We would have to change what we put in for x. a plus i times d wouldn't cut it. a plus i times d wouldn't cut it. So I think. If I were going to write a, a formula, a program, let me show you the only change I think you need to make. You could take this left sum program. Okay? And so I could have a new program I'd call midpoint. Okay? I'm not going to do it in class because it takes some time. Type the exact same program as left sum. But if you think about it, on one of these sub intervals, I don't want the left one, I don't want the right one, I want the point in the middle. Right? That's what I want for x. So what I need to do, you could keep this, that's fine. What needs to be changed is right here. Here's what I would store into x. a plus i times d. So this means like at step three, you're going to move over three of the deltas. So you'd move over 0.3 at step three. But we don't want to, to actually have the square root of 0 0.3 when we do midpoints. When we do midpoints, you would want like, so let me show it here midpoints, what would it look like? It would be square root of 0 plus 0 0.05. Like, you would want 0 0.05 times 0 0.1 plus square root of 0 0.15 times 0 0.1, etc. Does that make sense to you guys? I always want to use the midpoint of each subinterval. And they wouldn't be things like 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. They would be 0 0.05 and 0 0.15 and 0 0.25. You guys follow? So I need to program that in. And the way I see to program that in, 
just change this line as follows. A plus I times D plus D over 2. Add on an extra half D, half of the delta. That's the 0.05 in my example. Store that into X. Keep everything else the same. Oh, also change the final display. So I only see three changes that need to be made. Keep this the same. You make those three changes, you can run the program. So one question you could ask is, how do you get the exact answer, the exact answer um, for this problem? And the answer really ties into what Dan just said. If I want to be more accurate, I take my formula. So again, this is my formula I've been using. By the way, this sum had a name. Do you remember what this sum was called? That's right. It's called a Riemann sum. Okay, a Riemann sum. All right? So here is... Let me give you the definition of a Riemann sum. This will actually start today's notes in a way, okay? And I'll do that. But before... You guys ready? You guys sound good. All right, so here we go. Again, I want to... Spoiler alert, the, the fundamental theorem is about to be displayed, at least part of it. And we'll get the rest of it uh, in a minute. So... Suppose you have a problem like we just had. You have a function, and you're trying to find the area under the curve. Okay? We know the process. You divide it up, right? And if you want to be more accurate, what has to happen? You make the size of the rectangles smaller, right? So here's, here's the game. Let's say, let F be a continuous function on the closed interval A, B. All right? And actually, I'll make a little note. We don't need this, really. We don't need it to be continuous. But let's just say it is, because most of the functions we're dealing with are continuous, OK? Let f be a continuous function on the closed interval a, b. And then we define. Oh wait, before that, before we do the definition, we always do this. Let delta, how do I want to say this? Let delta be a partition of AB into n subintervals. And that's a little vague right there. I don't like that. Let me see how your book says it a little bit better. Well, uh, uh, we'll fix that in a second. We'll look at the book. But let me say what I want to say. We define this now, now what is this this is called the definite integral we define the definite integral 
to be a limit and the way you read that is as delta goes to zero of and here I'm going to write my Riemann sum k equals 1 to n f of x k star times delta x k provided that this limit exists. Okay, so there's my definition of what's called the definite integral. That's the topic for today. That's what 5.2 is entitled. But just because I wrote down the def definition and just because you wrote down the definition doesn't mean we understand it quite yet. So let me help with that. Again, this piece of it here, what is this called? A Riemann sum. That's what we've been doing. We've been computing Riemann sums. The only difference here is that I'm taking a limit. And what does this mean? This means the limit as the size of the subintervals approaches what? Goes to zero. That's what this really means. This is what Dan said. Make, make the rectangles really small width, you'll be more accurate. Now, could you make the width of a rectangle zero? The answer is no. But can you take the limit of these answers? Well, that answer is yes. Here, look at our sheet again about where we did the left sum and right sum from last time. Let me really zoom in so we can see what's happening. You check this out. Whether you do the left sum or the right sum, when you put lots and lots of thin rectangles, you can see that the area under the curve is getting very close to what? Four and, you know what fraction that's getting close to? 0.6 repeating? Yeah, four and two thirds. So the exact value here is four and two thirds. But I guess what you need to know is, if we want the exact value, and by the way, it's being done down here, the definite integral, okay? How would I write the exact value of the example from last time? Well, remember last time what the function was in, in the calculator? It was f of x equals what? x squared plus 1. And we computed that the area under the curve was getting close to 4 and 2 thirds. How do we get it exactly? Well, it's funny because the notation you would use is this. x squared plus 1 dx. And the only thing you would do different is you would make it a definite integral by putting a number here and a number there. By the way, what numbers do I put there? Do you guys know? A and B, that's right. You put A and B there. Last time those were 0 and 2. So this is the exact value. Let me go to today's lesson again. And let me do the example. So for example, um, we can compute the definite integral from A to B square root of x. Oh, wait a minute. I know what a and b are, right? Here. So today, what would a and b equal? Look back up top. Yeah. And we'll put the 0 on the bottom and we'll put the 4 on the top. That's a and b. Does it matter? It does. Because cause this is kind of where you're, you're moving left to right. You're moving left to right. This is our starting point and this is our ending point, just like for sigma notation. I want you to go k equals 1 to infinity. Okay? So we're moving from 0 to 4. The function I put in here is 
square root of x, and I put dx here. Now, you might ask, why do we use this notation for the limit of a Riemann sum? Spoiler alert, because this is what Newton and Leibniz figured out. They figured out, hey, I've got a better way to compute those areas than you've ever done before. All that adding, you don't have to. Instead of doing all that adding, I can do an antiderivative. Here, if I write this without the 0 and 4, that means take the antiderivative. <laughs> Bless you. That means take the antiderivative, right? So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to take the antiderivative of the square root of x. Of course, that's x to the 1 half, right? What's the antiderivative of x to the 1 half? It's x to the 3 halves, but what do I have to put out front? 2 thirds. Right? And normally I know you put plus c. But that's not what I'm going to do. Here. I'm going to draw a line over here, and I'm going to put a 4 and a 0. And we'll explain this a little more as we do it. Okay? But I just want to show you something. Notice what I get if I do 2 thirds of 4 to the 3 halves power. Hmm, what's that? Oh, yeah. Hate for you to miss the good stuff. 2 thirds of 4 to the 3 halves power. What does that equal? Oh, how do you compute that? What's the first thing you would compute? Well, probably this root, right? Let's take the square root of 4. So this equals 2 thirds times 2 to what power? To the third. So this is 2 thirds of 8. And so I just got, after some work here, that this is 16 thirds. 16 thirds? Really? Let's see. Calculator. Um, 16 divided by 3. Wow. That's the exact sum? What did you guys get for, I have right sum 5.42. What would you get for left sum? 5.2 something. So the exact value Look how quick that was. Look how quick that was. Okay? And this is where Newton and Leibniz get the credit. They figured out that somehow an antiderivative and the endpoints gives you the answer. Okay? So here's the spoiler. This is part of Monday's class. Here we go. Fundamental theorem of calculus. Part two. It's kind of weird I'm showing you part two before part one. Except that I think this is the most useful part. Okay? Fundamental theorem of calculus. Part 2. Here it is. Let big F of x, uh, let, me, let me start with little f of x. Let little f of x be a nice function on the closed interval a, b. What do I mean by nice? Well, that would, that would work, actually. If it's differentiable, it's nice. There's other kinds of, it doesn't have to be differentiable. Um, one reason that would work is because if it's continuous, that's nice. But there's also other functions that this will work for, what I'm about to do, okay? Algebraic. Yeah, algebraic functions are nice, okay? Most of the functions you can think of probably work here, okay? 
So I'm just going to write nice because you don't need all the names right now. If you do, you can look them up in the book. Now let big F of X be an antiderivative of little f of x. And here's what the fundamental theorem part 2 says. Then, if you want to know the value of this, what's this again? This is a limit of what? Had it on the last page. What the heck is this definite integral? It's the limit of what kind of sum? Of a Riemann sum. I won't pretend we all know what Riemann sums are because I've said it for two days now, right? So if you want to compute the limit of this Riemann sum, because you're trying to find the area under the curve, for instance, right? It turns out that that will equal capital F of B minus capital F of A. It turns out that'll work. This is what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. Example. You guys can do this. Last class, we had to find the definite integral. We didn't know this is what we were finding. I didn't write it this way. But when we learned left sum and right sum, you guys used the calculator to approximate this value. You divided it up into four rectangles on the board, then you did 100 rectangles in your calculator. But now we have a faster way to do it. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute big F. What's big F? Well, talk to each other about that, because if we can't do that, then I should wait till Monday. Plus X. Anything else? Plus C. Ah, plus C, right? <coughs> That's the antiderivative. Well, when I say that, how many antiderivatives are there? Infinitely many. Okay? And the symbol we use is we put a 0 over here and a 2 over here. Notice that, again, these are A and B. But when you write this line, you're saying, I'm going to evaluate the antiderivative, and I'm going to put in 2, and then I'm going to put in 0, and I'm going to subtract them. So here, multicolor going at it here, f of b. Let's do that in blue right over here. I get 1 third of 2 cubed plus 2 plus c. Right? And I need to subtract f of a. So what do I subtract? 1 third of 0 cubed plus 0 plus C. I love when I get zero for one of the, these things have a name, these A and B. These are called limits of integration. And it's kind of funny that they use the word limits because remember that in the definition of Riemann sum, there's a limit also, but that's different. These are the endpoints. They call them the limits of integration. It's too bad they use the word limits, but that's what they say. Okay? So I plug in the endpoints, the limits of integration. And now let's see what we get. Well, I love when you get zeros, because notice almost all that goes away. You see that? That's zero. That's zero. Also, do you notice something? Plus C and... You distribute the negative, you're going to get minus C. You see that? Good. From now on, when I have a definite integral, don't write the C. We don't need it. Because we're going to do F of B minus F of A anyways. It's going to subtract off. So from now on, I'm not going to write that. Okay. So what's the answer? The exact value. Let's see. One-third of eight plus 2. 
8 thirds plus, didn't I just do this? 14 thirds. That was kind of stupid, huh? The other example. Today we were doing the integral from 0 to 4 of the square root of x dx, right? That was from the homework where they said divide it into 40 subintervals. I'd like you to try this one now and see if you can compute it. Let's do that. I'll pause for a second while you work it out. I'm really confused. So this one you guys did. That was 16 thirds. I thought this was the same one. This was 14 thirds. Okay. They just look similar because, okay. And 14 thirds, what is that calculator wise? Let's do that. May as well get it. 14 thirds is, okay. 4.6 repeating, that's the exact value. And did we get that on the homework last night when we did the left sum and right sum? I guess. We're pretty close to that. Okay. Anyways, this is what you're going to learn on Monday. But already, the homework is going to hint at how do you, how do, you do problems um, with the definite integral. So maybe we'll look at the homework a little bit so you can kind of see what's coming. For the weekend, 19 to 39 odd from the book. Uh, wrong thing. Here it is. Right. Sorry. Here. So 19. They give me a Riemann sum in these problems. I'll go ahead and try 20 with you. And the question is, can you write the definite integral that corresponds to it? So let me turn this up a little bit so we can see. Take a look at number 20. Consider the following limits of Riemann sums. And let's see if we can write what's going on here. Okay. Well, I know because it says limit as delta goes to zero of the Riemann sum, I know it's a definite integral. Definite integral means I need to put A and B because I'm going to have to do that for the fundamental theorem. What, uh, what do you put in for A and what do you put in for B? Yeah, those are given right after the function. So negative 2 would be the left-hand limit and 2 would be the right-hand limit. Okay? Now what about the function? It's not going to be square root of x this time. The function is in parentheses. Okay, and so can you tell me what function we're doing here? Well, it's 4 minus x squared. 4 minus x squared. See that? And now, there's my dx. Because remember, Instead of using delta x, when we take the limit, we put a differential here. A differential is an infinitely small increment. And so that, that delta x, we now write, write dx. Okay? By the way, number 20, they don't ask you to compute this. That's Monday. But we know how already, right? Well, a couple ways. One way to do it, Take the antiderivative of this. That'll give you the exact value if you use the process I just couldn't resist. Another way to do it? Calculator, right? I could go ahead and do left sum 
or write sum. Oh, my calculator only has write sum. I'll do write sum. So what do I need? I go to y equals screen. I type in my function, 4 minus x squared. Enter. Hey, let me check a look at a graph. Yeah, parabola opening downward, right? Let me zoom in, actually. So what am I really finding? I'm finding the area between negative 2 and 2, underneath the parabola and above the x-axis, right? OK, so now I'll go and run the program. Program, write sum, enter. What do you put in for A? Negative 2. Yep. What do you put in for B? What do you put in for N? Depends how accurate you want to be, right? I mean, 1,000 will be pretty accurate. The only problem is it'll take a while. That's the problem with 1,000. Oh, good thing I have a computer instead of a calculator. Yours takes longer. So it says, I think the answer is about 10 and 2 thirds. 10 and 2 thirds. You guys with me? Hey, I want to point something out about number 20. Remember I said I really like the problem before it because there's a zero here, right? Because that makes the calculations easier when you do the antiderivative. I want to show you another way to do problem 20. See if this makes sense to you. I'm going to set a equal to 0 and b equal to 2 and n equal to 1,000. But what I'm going to do at the end then, I'll just take my area and then do what? Multiply that by 2. 10.66. Right? So we do things like that a lot in calculus. We look for symmetry. Because I have the symmetry of the parabola, I can do things like that. And, and some of these tricks are hinted at in the problems. No, even now. I'm going to do it today. The, the, here's some funny problems. Use geometry, not Riemann sums, to evaluate the following definite integrals. Let me try 24. So it says we want the definite integral from negative 4 to positive 2 of 2x plus 4 dx. Well, if we're going to use geometry, you better draw a picture. Well, I know how to do that. I have my graph paper. 2x plus 4 goes through the point, well, 0 comma 4, and it has a slope of what? <coughs> 2. So I claim it goes through right here, negative 2, 0. It goes through if I throw in a 2, I'm at 2 comma 8. And if I go here, I'm at negative 4 comma, hmm, negative 4, right? Negative 4, negative 4. You might find this interesting. So let's go to the calculator, change the function y equals 2x plus 4. Enter. Now, by the way, their idea here is this. When they say use geometry, here's their idea. They're going to take this, and they're going to say this is equal to the integral from 
negative 4 to negative 2 of 2x plus 4 dx plus the integral um, from negative 2 to positive 2 of 2x plus 4 dx. And they're going to say that you can do that. Because what you're doing, basically, when you go from negative 2 to positive 2, you're going and finding the area under the curve here. I'll, I'll color that in in blue. That's this piece. But from negative 4 to negative 2, that's this piece. I'll color that in red. Now, let me go ahead and use my, well, let me graph it first of all. I uh, better zoom out again. OK. And actually, let me change the window and go from negative 4 to positive 2. Graph. OK, so there's my line. Some of it's above the x-axis and some of it's below the x-axis. And so you'll notice I'm going to start off the following way. I'm going to compute the area of the triangle on the right. Oh, that's easy. What's the area of a triangle? So the area of this triangle is 1 half base times height. So what's the base? Well, it goes from negative 2 to positive 2, so it looks like it's 4. And the height goes from 0 all the way to 8. It's 8. So 1 half of 32. I claim that blue triangle has an area of 16. You guys with me? So watch this. I'm going to run my program again. A is, let's say, negative 2. B is positive 2. And they say N is whatever you want. I'll go with 100. Did I get about 16? Yeah, so I'm doing it right. But watch what happens if you do this. What happens if you start at A equals negative 4 and B equals positive 2? And n equals, I'll even do 1,000 to be more accurate. Watch. It doesn't give you something bigger than 16. It actually gave me something smaller than 16, which is strange. And actually, let's do the geometry, and let's, let's talk about the area of this red triangle. What's the area of the red triangle going to be? Well, that area is 1 half, um, what's the base? 2, right? Because it goes from negative 4 to negative 2. And what's the height? 4. four. And so that's 4. And what do you notice then about the answer? It went from 16 down to what? 12. And so here is a fact about this definite integral. Remember we said the definite integral represents area? Well, it does as long as you are above the x-axis. If you're below the x-axis, it's going to be the opposite of the area. It's actually going to be negative. Matter of fact, to show you that, this is the last thing I'll do. I'll go from negative 4 to negative 2. 100. My answer is going to be negative, about negative 4. You see that? So I guess the last thing to say, before wrapping it up for the weekend here, is that the definite integral gives what's called net area. And so in this example, I have to do 16 minus 4, 12. It's the net area. That's an important point to make. 
So I didn't go over any optimization today. Well, if you want help with that homework, you're welcome to stick around. I, I'm going to be around for a while. Here, tell me. We have a meeting at noon. So. Okay. Sure. The, the, the net area of the whole thing is 12. Right? This area is 16, this area is 4, but we count it as negative when we, when we compute the integral. It's like anti-area when you're below the x-axis, that's right. Or you, you do count it as negative. That's what the that's what the integral does. Oh, okay. All right, okay. But it kind of depends what they ask. Are they asking for the area, for the integral? What do you got? Some homework. Cool. Oh, that's right. Oh, you leave Sunday. Okay. I can I can stick around for our Cool. Let's do that then. Let's do that. I'll grade it in there and I'll okay. take care of it. Um, do you have a list like the homework stuff to make sure you got everything turned in? Hmm. I just put it in my computer last night. I have this sheet which tells me what's recent. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, you've turned in everything recent. Okay, cool. Yeah, and you're always on the ball. You're even doing the check point, quick checks, and I think it's helping. Yeah. It Thank you.